I'm, firstly, it's uh, a great pleasure to be here uh, personally. Uh, I was actually the third uh, director of CAPE, and together with Paolo Dorenzio, who's here today, Tim Williamson, who many of you know, Karen Christensen, Ruth Driscoll, we actually did the first uh, CAPE conference, as it was called then. We didn't call it PFI. And that was, if I remember rightly, in 2006. So, uh, you know, there's a 20-year pedigree or more behind what we're doing now. And uh, it's great that this goes on. And it's fabulous that we can have the sort of conversations that, that uh, we've already started this morning. One thing that has changed is that the technology is a whole lot better. So 20-odd uh, years ago, there was no live streaming. I didn't have to worry about questions coming in from the internet. Uh, but also, we had no Twitter. And I would like to encourage you to use your Twitter. Use the uh, hash public finance tag. So if we're talking a lot of nonsense, just please, uh, more nonsense from Andrew Lawson. I can deal with it. Uh, if someone is saying something brilliant, then, you know, double uh, the attention, so we'll make sure we, we have people coming in and, and uh, making comments. Um, before we start, firstly, Sam had to rush in from a previous meeting, so I'm going to give him a couple of minutes to organize himself. And, and uh, before we start, I'd like you all to take an opportunity <coughs> to speak to each other. Uh, I mean, one of the ideas of this isn't that you're all just listening to us, it's more that you're talking to each other, sharing ideas, getting to know each other, making networks. So, a little task for five minutes. Speak to your neighbor, and in particular, if it's a neighbor you don't know. Okay? Introduce yourselves, find out uh, what they do. If it's someone you know, your task is to find out something you don't know about them. You know, like for example, they have a hobby uh, playing the ukulele, or, or that they, you know, they mountain climb at the weekends, okay? So, take five minutes just to have a chat with your neighbours.
Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you have exceeded your brief, which is fabulous. Now, just before I move on, and if we have a microphone, do we have a microphone, please? Yes, you're still exceeding your brief at the back. That's fabulous. What I would like, who learned something really kind of interesting or really weird or even a bit funky that they want to share about their neighbor? Or maybe you, you can share it for yourself, something that you, you think is unusual for a PFM specialist. Who, who wants to throw, throw something out? Oh, come on, don't be so bashful. Well, I, I will, I All will. right, Mark, please. So, Sergei here, can, can I say on your behalf, he has, his record marathon time is three hours, 13 minutes, done at the Chicago Marathon. <laughs> okay. Any musicians? Did we discover any musicians here? There must be some musicians out of 60 people. Paolo, you used to play some drums, didn't you? Didn't you play some drums? So the, my latest uh, passion is the trombone. Aha, uh -huh, you see? Thank you. Okay. Is that blowing your own horn? Okay, so this all goes to show that public finance specialists are actually quite exciting. <laughs> we run marathons, we play the trombone, etc. But let's move on. Uh, picking up on this morning session, what we wanted to do in this session is a little bit to ground it, to ground it in some personal experiences of what things work, what things don't work, and out of that to look at whether we can put together some sort of a hypothesis about going forward. And just to contextualize it, and maybe to over-summarize Mark's presentation from this morning. What we're really asking is, if we want public finance management to support better public services, what is the way forward? Is it the case that the tools of public finance management, including medium-term budgeting approaches, performance budgeting, uh, different types of performance incentives to, to sub-national governments, that that toolbox is actually adequate. The problem is we're either not applying it enough or we're not applying it properly. So that, that hypothesis would be, we've got the tools. Let's just use them more and use them better. Another hypothesis would be to say, no. You know, we've tried that for 20 years. It's only worked in very exceptional environments. And actually, we need to think of a different way of working, a different kind of paradigm driven in other ways. I'm not sure what that paradigm would be. There is, I would argue, potentially a third approach. 20 years ago, when I started working on public finance, people used to talk a lot about civil service reform. They would talk a lot about human resource management, all of these sorts of things. And it was considered then that the role of public finance was basically to balance the books and produce accounts, and that the real delivery agents were the civil service reform people who would make sure that staff turned up on time, they were properly motivated, properly managed, etc. And it may well be that a third hypothesis is we've already done too much. <laughs> let's, let's stay out of this service delivery area and leave other people to do it. I'm agnostic out of those three. I mean, I think each of those hypotheses has some, some merit, and we might even find that in small ways each of them can be applied in different countries. So I'd just like to throw that out and then ask our panelists to, to speak from their perspectives on, on where they see uh, the, the role going forward to make public finance work for service delivery. So I'll ask Suzanne Flynn to start. Suzanne is uh, ex-Fiscal uh, Affairs Department from the IMF, uh, has worked in many parts of the world, in particular in, in, in Eastern Europe. Um, so I'll ask Suzanne to start, and then I will allow Dorian, uh, former health minister in Slovenia, to speak from his personal examples, and Sam Goldman, to speak from his examples of, of an NGO working predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa on, on education issues. And I'll allow Neil, who has several hats, but, but did have a hat working in the Ministry of Finance of, the, of uh, South Africa, and can bring to bear that experience, as well as the experience supporting reforms in, in other ministries of finance across Africa. So, Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, as Andrew said, my name is Suzanne Flynn. I now work in uh, Southeast Europe, based in Ljubljana, covering the Western Balkans. Um, after spending several years working in Africa, so um, I can speak to 
to some of the differences between the two. And uh, regarding Andrew's question, I think, are all areas working well? Well, obviously not. Um, do we have enough tools? We've got a huge toolbox, and there seem to be new ones being developed mm -hmm. every, every year. Um, <coughs> but I think countries are very different, and I think a lot of the effectiveness of PFM um, processes depends on um, the heritage of the PFM system. Um, because, uh, and the strength of the Ministry of Finance, because what I see in Southeast Europe as relatively weak ministries of finance and strong line ministries, particularly infrastructure ministries, um, not necessarily health ministries, but, um, and the influence of the Ministry of Finance is, is one of ensuring compliance, really. They mm. seem to be more of a kind of involved in in the budget process, getting the budget documents out, but not uh, not at all in the analytic analytics. So they're not really working on um, analysing the spending patterns. And I think the relationship with the line ministries is is not particularly strong either. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I'll come back to a little bit later because I think this is key to to the whole process. Um, focusing on compliance with uh, laws, regulations, issuing instructions, and that seems to be the predominant behaviour. Um, whereas I think in more stronger ministries of finance you get more nuanced behaviour. Uganda is a good example where the Ministry of Finance um, has much more influence. Um, but then in that case, um, often the trust is not there. So it's a question of balance between, between the two. Um, I think um, the focus, as I said, is predominantly the budget. So anything that's not on the budget, um, the Ministry of Finance can tend to <coughs> try and avoid, which leads to lots of um, problems in the sectors. Um, in particular, and I can only speak to those sectors that I've looked at in the region, um, the health sector is um, underfunded and has a huge mandate in most of these ex-Yugoslav um, countries and Albania. Um, it's not affordable. But nobody is prepared to make those key decisions about, you know, how that system should look. So they're still um, using legacy approaches to the sector, which leads to uh, issues that could potentially be addressed by better PFM. But there's no real will to control spending in those sectors. So you have arrears throughout the system, um, basically unpaid bills, which of course leads to supply chain issues, um, and. The Ministry of Finance, I guess, but not being very powerful, cannot really control that spending, or is not willing to. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it turns a blind eye to what's going on in that sector because it's not within the budget. So I think that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so you can introduce medium-term expenditure frameworks, program-based budgeting, whatever you like, but it's not really going to address that problem um, in that sector. Um, another issue um, in the Western <coughs> Balkans in particular is the infrastructure gap. So um, there's a lot of interest in building new roads. And we, as a uh, fiscal affairs department, are very, um, very interested in the Ministry of Finance increasing its role in that sector because there are examples of significant investments in parallel roads to the same place, uh, which is basically a waste of resource. Um, there's uh, an interest in PPPs, which are of course risky, mm -hmm. and again, the, um, the Ministry of Finance needs to be very involved in that, but we do see a situation where they're not keen to be involved because it's being politically driven and driven by um, powerful line ministries. Mm -hmm. And if the minister, in my view, if the Ministry of <coughs> Finance is not interested in fiscal affordability and sustainability of these projects, then they should pack up and, and go home, really. I mean, that's my little controversial part. <laughs> um, so, should we leave it to the line ministries? Do we think they're doing fine already? Um, I think, as I said earlier, I think the relationship between the ministries of finance in the, in the region, and probably more generally, um, isn't strong enough. The coordination and collaboration is not strong enough between the two. Um, and we see that through 
um, our efforts in the region and more globally to introduce spending review processes, which I think could be very powerful tools to bring together line ministries and uh, ministries of finance in doing, undertaking jointly the analytical work. So moving away from this control um, perspective, but more to working jointly and, and, and benchmarking, looking at what other countries are doing and coming up with joint solutions. Um, but to be frank, so far in the region, uh, spending reviews have only been really used effectively when there's been a fiscal crisis. So in other words, we need to cut spending, let's have a spending mm -hmm. review. And mm -hmm. it's not institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think it could be a tool that could have much broader level of effectiveness. Right. Um, am, am I out of time? No, you're good. So, um, <laughs> uh, another, <coughs> another reform that I see a lot globally is program-based budgeting, and it is no mentioned in the paper that was circulated. Um, intuitively, I think that's a very good thing. It makes sense. Um, but I think it can develop into a bit of a monster. Mm -hmm. with multiple levels of indicators and hell to, hell to monitor effectively. Um, and ultimately, even in developed countries, doesn't tend to have um, much influence over allocation decisions, even in Australia where you know, they led, led the, the, the way in, in that. Um, so <coughs> in conclusion, I see uh, a disconnect between sectors and ministries of finance. But also, I see a disconnect on the part of um, advisors, of TA providers, capacity development providers, in, in the sectors and in the PFM world. Um, they, we're each working in, in our separate silos, in the same way that ministries of finance and line ministries are working. And we don't really connect very well. And that's, I guess, these kind of conferences are one of the steps towards helping in that. We all have our own log frames, our own objectives, and we, they don't necessarily coincide with each other. So I think we need to start working a little bit more on how we can um, bring together the, the, the sector experts who are looking at service delivery. Um, also, the, those who are working on civil service reforms, you mentioned that. I still think it's important to improve service delivery. We need better management at the service delivery level. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, health centres where no one pitches up all day. I mean, there's lots of examples. Teachers taking private lessons and not attending the public school to teach. There's, there's plenty of examples of that. And that, to me, comes down to poor management and oversight. Yeah. Um, and that is linked to salaries, pay, mm -hmm. staffing levels, etc. So we shouldn't we shouldn't park that and think that's a done deal. That needs to, to remain on the agenda. Um, so with that, um, I think all of those issues were alluded to in both Mark and Ratton's comments, um, and so I share them, essentially. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, so it, one interesting point I find, um, I mean, coming from an Anglo-Saxon tradition, I always tend to assume that ministries of finance are, are all powerful and can, and can influence things a lot. And in fact, that the problem is perhaps that they're too interventionist. Uh, but it is rather interesting that in, in a different uh, legal and institutional setting, and indeed a setting which is probably more characteristic of the rest of the world, uh, ministries of finance are perhaps not active enough. Yeah. And, the, and that uh, sector ministries perhaps develop fiefdoms which the Ministry of Finance is unable to influence. Uh, or, or active. <coughs> in the wrong things, like controlling yeah. small things mm -hmm. and missing the big picture. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, that gives us a very good opportunity to pass to Dorian, okay. uh, a former <coughs> Minister of Health in charge of his own fiefdom. Uh, let, let, let's see what you have to, to say about that, Dorian. First of all, uh, <coughs> it's a privilege to be here with you and to share my experiences. I concluded 30 years uh, of working health. Um, my background, I'm also a mathematician, not only a medical doctor. I passed the, my, in my career from hospital to ministry as a state secretary, then for three years minister. And uh, lately I'm uh, giving consultancy besides being a card cardiologist. I'm working more than 10 countries, more than 100 projects. And um, I would like to share uh, with you some, some uh, something what I learned. So more or less, 
European Union and the uh, rest of Europe or Europe. So more or less, we have national healthcare systems. We, they are based on same values, solidarity, product, um, fairness, accessibility, universality. But you know where we came? The last results of the year ago, that um, one out of five patients admitted in EU hospitals was there without any rationale, without any reason. So they were, they, they faced, 12% of them, they faced adverse events. So 20% of waste. We are in a, in a process of decreasing plastic and so on in waste. When are we going to tackle healthcare systems? When? So probably we were focused in efficiency, effectiveness, investing, investing in infrastructure, and we forgot of the, of the main reason why we have healthcare system to increase health. Some experiences, where to start? Prevention, promotion. I worked in, uh, lately in Serbia. One out of three Serbian citizen is a smoker. So I said, you know, you have only one goal in your national strategy, total tobacco ban. Quitting smoking will decrease cardiovascular mortality for 50%. Lowering LDL cholesterol only 30%, physical activity only 20%. So, promote tobacco ban. You know why not? Because all politicians or their relatives are close to tobacco industry. <laughs> it might be that some of them are also uh, uh, close to starting uh, industry and so on. So, relation with Minister of Finance. Uh, since I, I told you that. Um, uh, I was also mathematician and father of the Minister of Finance when I was Minister of Health, was my teacher, so I was very close to Minister of Finance. I was Minister in the period of crisis, so it was more or less very, in a way, easy, because there was always cutting the budget. So we just have to work on priorities. We settled the priorities. And I said, sorry, no budget for investment, no bu but we had to run the healthcare system. So in a way, the relation with Minister of Finance was uh, quite effective. Uh, we tried to increase taxes on, on tobacco. They promised me one million at the end of the year for uh, out of taxes, but unfortunately the government failed, so I cannot uh, tell you that the story concluded uh, uh, happily. But anyway, I just wanted to, to, to claim once again. First of all, we have to analyze. Secondly, we have to set priorities. Third, we have to focus on results, <coughs> on outcomes. Not on infrastructure, not on processes, but mainly on results. So, bet on quality and safety. Because as a um, very known uh, Professor Robert said, you know, you get what you, you pay. If you will pay for inefficiency, you will get inefficiency. If you will pay for quality, you will get the quality. So uh, invest appropriately the money which is available for, for health. And this might bring to the result. Because at the end of the day, even uh, uh, financing in, 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 uh, as a, as a, is an approach is how to change behavior of providers. Right incentives will produce correct and right results. Can I just I say, short? no, you were very good, Dorian. I was <laughs> impressed. Uh, Dorian, if I was the Minister of Finance, yeah. everything you've said would be complete music to my ears. Okay. I mean, it's almost exactly the same agenda that a Minister of Finance would have in the health sector. Did you find that that was the case where you were there? That when you were focusing on, on analysis, picking out the right priorities, that you had support from, from the Finance Ministry? Or, or, or were they in some ways, slowing things down? First of all, I said that I will never blame ministers <coughs> before and after me. But anyway, you know, uh, in, the, in the initial phase, there was an uh, agreement. Hmm. But let's say what uh, I will, re what I do regret, that in the final phase, he always sent experts to me. Mm -hmm. So, but in a way, it was a challenge for me, you know, because they were economists, I was mathematician, so we, we were playing with numbers, but there was no politician decision. So I was missing him in the last sessions when we should dis decide how to proceed. Okay. And in a way, I thought that he was just uh, trying to postpone uh, the moment of the final decision. Right, right. So maybe... Anyway, but anyway, when, when, when I came at the minister, I said, you know, we will 
we will not launch a reform because it will be unaccess unsuccessful, but we will uh, launch a process of upgrading the healthcare system because something or a, lo a lot of uh, uh, projects which has been launched are probably working well. So we will upgrade it. But first of all, we will have to define the benefit package and we will try to, to cover it with public finance. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the first initial step when we agreed. Lately, when I present it, unfortunately, the government will fail, so the, all the laws and everything uh, remain there. Uh, but in a way, yeah, uh, quite fair, but let's say from one to five, I will not give him more than four. Okay, well, that's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think to pick up on one of the comments Ratin Roy was making earlier, <coughs> politics somehow intervenes at the end, and there is a political dimension to all of this that we, we can't uh, leave behind. Yeah, but, you know, it depends on the... Uh, of, of, of countries, you know, let's say Slovenia, two million inhabitants, you know, so whenever I was in meetings, let's say with Germans or Italian, I was the one with one uh, right hand and there were one, uh, there were ten or more uh, experts on the other side. So the minister there was with a, with a group of experts. And in, in, let's say, in Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, it's, it's not the case. Yeah, you, you have to cover much more than, than in other countries. Right. It's okay. not only political decision, you have, you have to have also some expertise. Yes, okay. Thank you, Dorian. Uh, I'd like to pass to Sam uh, to share with us some, some experience from the education sector on, on this particular question, please. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, I work at the Education Partnerships Group. Um, we are a not-for-profit consultancy. We work almost entirely with education ministries. Um, it was interesting to hear about the sort of siloing of this. This is just not a lens that I would usually be looking through, this sort of public finance management, because we're very education-focused as an organisation. Obviously, we do interact sometimes with ministries of finance, but, 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 but relatively rarely, and we are don't tend to be working with other organisations that are working with ministries of finance. So there's an interesting, immediate interesting question for me there. Um, but what I thought, I mean, and we, and we primarily work in sub-Saharan Africa, um, so I thought I would try and, because I need to generalise and because I only have 10 minutes, um, would uh, focus on, um, on that part of the world and also on, on probably more low-income countries. We do work with a mix of low- and middle-income countries, but I'd focus more on the, on the low-income countries we're working with at the moment, um, like, uh, like Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we have previously uh, done a project in Liberia as well. Um, so I think from, from my perspective of working primarily with education ministries, at the, at the central level, by far the biggest problem is there's just nowhere near enough money. Um, so they're, they're, they're radically underfunded for what has been promised in terms of delivery. Um, so typically you have uh, campaign, election campaign promises to to provide universal free education, which is now largely happening, although not completely, at the um, basic education level, but, but is a long way off at the secondary education level. But you have promises to provide free universal secondary education, um, but, but, but nowhere near enough budgetary resource to, to actually deliver that. Um, and primarily the, the education budget, in, in, and again, I'm, I know I'm generalising massively here, and it is different in every country, but primarily nearly all of the education budgets in the countries we're working with are going on two things. They're going on either uh, teach directly to teacher salaries, um, because you have centralised teacher recruitment and, and pay, or they're going on uh, per-pupil school subsidies, uh, which, go, which are supposed to go to, to, to individual schools. 98% of education budgets are going on those two things. Uh, and my, my sense is that finance uh, ministries are because there's so much pressure on those two things, uh, very uh, uninterested in putting money into anything else beyond those two things. Uh, and it can be a real fight to get anything into a budget that isn't essentially going straight back out the door again, either directly to teachers or directly to schools. Um, and what that means in terms of sort of organisations like us that are trying to support on policy development is that you do see what Lamp Pritchett called capability traps developing where um, ministries, education ministries, because there is simply no other way they can get access to discretionary funding for new policy development, become very dependent on the international aid architecture for, um, 
for, for those things and indeed go out of their way to promise as many different new policies to as many different potential funders as possible so they can get access to all of the different funding streams which they can't get from their own finance ministry, um, which then uh, means that they haven't got the internal capacity to do any of those policy developments um, uh, as well as, as, as they would like to. Um, so you, the, the capabil capability trap issue is definitely a real one that we, uh, we experience when we're working uh, alongside ministries. Um, I mean, going down the, the sort of chain, you then have this sort of issue of the di distribution of funding um, to, in the two kind of main pots that, that I talked about, teachers uh, and, and school subsidies. Um, where teacher recruitment and pay is centralised, which is, in, is the case in, in, in most countries, um, you, uh, that, is, that is both, I think, probably necessary in most cases, but also an obvious source of inefficiency because you have a, you know, a, a often quite large populations where you're trying to recruit everyone centrally, distribute everyone to regions that they don't necessarily live in, where, which don't necessarily speak the same language as the, as, as the, language, the, the language that the teacher speaks. Um, you're trying to centralise payroll, um, and that causes all the inevitable problems that you'd expect it to do. But, but it's also probably necessary uh, at this stage in, in, in many of the places that, that we're working. Um, when it comes to sub subsidy payments or direct payments to schools, um, you know, one thing, you know, we talk a lot about school accountability and accountability in the education system and governance, and that's a lot of what we work on uh, as an organisation. Um, but I think we focus quite a lot on school accountability and probably not enough on the accountability relationship between central and local governments. Um, and one thing that I've certainly found um, uh, to be quite a consistent challenge is, is, this relation, is this very weak relationship between central and local government uh, where um, the central government find it very difficult to track expenditure that's been given to local government but also to hold local government accountable for the responsibilities that it has been given. Um, and uh, it feels to me like when we're having conversations about accountability and governance, that's a bit of the system that probably hasn't been focused on enough while there's a lot of investments been made in, say, school inspection systems or assessments and data dashboards for kids. Uh, we're, we're, we're sort of missing a bit of a trick on, on, on that kind of core relationship uh, in the system. And when we track finance flows in countries, it's often that part of the system where where there seems to be uh, a lot of inefficiency and a lot of leakage. Um, uh, and I think one uh, sort of interesting uh, development that uh, we're seeing again happening, uh, and I don't know if this is true in other sectors, but it's certainly true in, in, in education, is a sort of decentralization um, programs happening. Um, but without having centralised in the first place. Um, so you, you sort of have a situation where, where, where governments are, are sort of... And I, I'm, not, I'm still not quite sure where the pressure for these programmes is, is necessarily coming from, whether it's from sort of outside donors or sort of in, within, within country. Um, but there's sort of these, these sort of decentralisation programmes, which actually the education ministries are very worried about on the whole, because they don't feel they have enough control anyway, so then what are they decentralising? Um, and uh, some real confusion that that's creating as to who is responsible in the system for um, different aspects of delivery um, and who gets the money. And often those are then becoming different people or different parts of the system, um, which, which is creating further confusion. So um, I would be focused at the moment, uh, if I were in these ministries, on and actually centralising and trying to make it as clear as possible what the lines of responsibility are, having as, as strong a governance and accountability relationship as possible over local, uh, local government, and then thinking about decentralising power once you've got to that point. But it all seems to be happening rather at the same um, time. And then the last point I'd make is you often have ministerial structures which work against trying to um, make that governance easier because often local government will be responsible to a different ministry and the education ministry is, give it, ha, is sort of setting responsibilities for local government but has no formal uh, management or, or, or control and that works again very differently in different countries. But these are some of the, the real challenges that, that we found and I think so my sense just to wrap up is that the, 
the, the sort of efficiency problems are not happening at the national level. That's just, there's just a, a problem with the lack of, of, of funding, um, and which is creating sort of these capability traps, but that's quite different from a lot of the kind of efficiency problems that public finance management is designed to solve. When you go down further into the system at the relationship between central, local, and then onto the school, you do have inefficiency and leakage, but that's largely to do with governance and accountability structures rather than finance management tools per se. Can I take you back to this issue of the teacher's payroll? Mm. Um, you missed uh, Ratin Roy's anecdote earlier right. that um, the chief minister of Orissa was very happy to have 40% vacancies amongst his teachers. <laughs> now, uh, knowing India a little bit, uh, my guess is that the reason why the chief minister wanted this is because it gave him space to recruit what are known in India as Vidya volunteers, uh, mm. volunteer teachers who had taken on short-term contracts uh, are much cheaper than the uh, regular teachers um, and much easier to manage because of the contract structure. And so that's sort of like a local approach, not necessarily the best, but a local approach to dealing with some of the issues of productivity of teachers. And I just wonder in your experience if there's any, anything that ministries of finance should be doing or that you have seen that they have done well to help uh, basically raise teacher, pro teacher productivity and, and, and keep this sort of burgeoning teacher payroll under control? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think the, you've, got, you've, got a, you've got a set of practical issues and then a set of political issues. Like again, in most of the places we work, teacher unions are very powerful and uh, are... Uh, kind of, I wouldn't say always the case, but are often a bulwark against the kind of reform that you're talking about. Um, not just because they represent a very large proportion of voters, but because often they actually run the, the elections are run through schools, and therefore they, they have quite a lot of direct uh, influence. Um, so, so I think you've got a set of political challenges. I think on the practical side... Um, it comes back to these sort of questions of governance and accountability primarily. You know, the, the, the problems that you've got are, uh, as Suzanne said, teachers sort of teaching in, in other schools and sort of shadow teachers and that kind of, of, of thing. It's not conceptually difficult to deal with that problem, but you need to have information and you need to have the accountability over the local government officials who are responsible for uh, checking and monitoring that. And that's where I think the relationship often breaks down. So I think it's... And where you have stronger systems of accountability, like Rwanda, say, you do, you, you have closer relationships there. Right. OK. Thank you. Well, I think this is an issue we might come back to, because it does really permeate every education sector in every country in the world. Let's go over to Neil. I, I didn't give you a proper introduction, Neil, but Neil Cole used to work um, with the Treasury of South Africa at the time when uh, Trevor Manuel uh, was minister. And for the last... 15 years now, has been, director, has been director of CABRI, the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, uh, which I think many of you know. It's an organization that works primarily with budget directors, but with ministries of finance in general, to share experience across uh, the continent about how to improve the effectiveness of the finance ministry. And service delivery is a big part of that agenda, I believe. So thank, thank you, you, Neil. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so <coughs> this morning we heard that um, India has 30 state uh, governments. Well, South Africa has um, much fewer, only nine. Um, and it's provincial governments that are within a sort of hybrid um, unitary system. And the province um, that is located down in the south is called the Western Cape uh, Province. And the one thing that um, stands out, um, not only because of its... Um, tourism numbers that stands out in the Western Cape um, province is that it has been performing consistently well in terms of financial management. Um, and it has received the best audit findings by the South African Auditor, Auditor General. So I was quite surprised when the, the Premier, who is the person that, that leads the province, um, had the following to say in concluding an opinion piece um, following what was a very good audit um, finding in, in, in 2019. 
where he said, while we must continue to do everything in our power to avoid corruption, we must not halt service delivery simply to comply with the Auditor General. And if we had some time, maybe we could do a poll um, in the room to see who agrees with, with the Premier of the Western Cape and, and, and who disagrees. Um, I, was, I was a bit shocked when I, when I read this, um, and in my incredulity, I, um, um, because social media is so accessible, I had the following to say, um, if we can get this to move along, okay. Yeah, ah, there we go. <clears throat> so my initial reaction contained some of these, some of these points. The first was that it was quite inconsistent because he started off bragging about his province doing so well, um, but then was saying that, well, if there was a toss-up between compliance and service delivery, I'm going to um, um, move for service delivery. And maybe even a, a, a hint of populism there as well. Um, and, and I'm surprised because I believed that 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 connection between good financial governance and good governance, um, which is what the province was known for, was quite known. Um, and especially the electorate, um, um, in particular the electorate of the political party that is in power in, in the Western Cape, would expect um, um, good governance of, of their political party. Um, and also being one of the developers of South Africa's Public Finance Management Act and, and subsequent amendments, it, it hurt me quite, quite a lot um, that, we had, that we had put together a public finance law that is seen to be hampering service delivery. Um, it's one of, the, one of the things that we believed we freed um, with the development of the Public Finance Management Act was for the manager to manage, um, but at the same time to hold the manager responsible for the funds that were allocated. Um, and then also, you know, getting into the very slippery slope of non-compliance for the sake of service delivery was quite, was quite worrying. But then in all fairness to, to, to the Premier of, of the Western Cape, I, I thought about these policy dialogues that we have as CABRI, and the idea behind the policy dialogue is to bring together finance officials in government and line ministry officials. So dealing with an issue of health financing, we would get these um, the two officials together um, to speak about what is essentially health financing issues. And part of it is to, I suppose, better understand um, the perspectives of the two, and I think um, it, it's also what, what was touched on by, by previous panelists. Um, and, and in these dialogues, um, what, what becomes quite clear is that officials that work in finance ministries think dif very differently about these issues as officials in, in spending ministries. In your finance ministry, um, and we I think a bit of a, a sticky problem here or should we say a bit of a lag <laughs> in a Ministry of Finance. I mean, the, the, the central concern is, is fiscal discipline. Um, and if I'm thinking of South Africa's budget that is being tabled today, I mean, this is something that the finance probably is going to be driving and the central theme of South Africa's um, a budget that is being delivered today is the issue of, of fiscal discipline. Allocative efficiency, essentially why we've put together these elaborate uh, budget processes so that we can ensure that budgets are allocated for the things that are the most important priorities. As finance ministry officials, we think about compliance. We're the ones that have designed the Public Finance Management Act. We're the ones that develop the procurement laws, etc. And we like to think that our power also lies in, in, in everyone else in government complying with those. <coughs> Absorptive capacity is, is a question that is always asked when new money is asked for. Um, so do you have the absorptive capacity to spend the additional money? You've underspent on your previous budget, so you know, what, what proof is there that you are going to perform? 
Um, and then I think we make the mistake in finance ministry of thinking that PFM reformance belongs to us. So whether it is the medium term expenditure framework or um, program based budgeting or cash management, we think it's a reform that belongs to the Ministry of Finance. And then also the failures of it also lies with the Ministry of Finance. And then I've heard some finance ministers and I mean, notably uh, the Trevor Manuel <coughs> that um, Andrew spoke of, um, said that all, he was fond of saying that all good spending plans have been funded. And it was obviously attaching a lot to what was a good spending plan, right? Um, and we do believe that service delivery belongs somewhere else. I remember when Andrew, um, when um, Trevor Manuel, I know you have no ambition to be a finance minister, right? Okay. <laughs> when, when Trevor Manuel left and um, the, the former um, uh, commissioner of the tax authority, who was more of a service delivery guy, became the finance minister, and he was setting us all these challenges that sounded to us like um, that of a service delivery department, and all we knew was to give policy advice. It unsettled us quite a bit because we believed that service delivery um, belonged somewhere else. And then, you know, as a service delivery ministry, I think this has already been said, is that more money um, is needed and not necessarily PFM, PFM reforms. Um, so it's not really about effectiveness and efficiency and, and, um, and spreading things over a medium term period. But if you just give us more money, and, and a common refrain um, from um, spending ministries, especially when presenting their plans to, to parliament or their reports to parliament is to say, we were unable to achieve what we had set out to achieve because the treasury did not give us enough money. Right? Um, and I think service delivery ministries also believe that program budgeting, MTS, belongs to the finance ministries. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but in, in the work that we do, I think it's about um, finding each other um, because we do have different, uh, different perspectives. Um, and the budget process provides an opportunity. I think it's, it's maybe one could say it's a bit of the genesis of where we're going to start finding each other to start looking at that connect between PFM and, and, and service delivery because it's an opportunity where budget bids, uh, bids and plans are being presented and where very hard decisions are taken in terms of what is to be funded. And if we think of the budget as being the most important policy st statement of a government, this is where that statement is, is, is developed. Um, but it needs to be inclusive and, and hopefully also comprehensive, that there are no secret deals that are going on that could undermine the allocation to a priority. Um, it provides a structured discussion where technical as well as political inputs are going to be are going to be received, and I found um, with the South African budget process that that political input into the budget process was an important one um, because it 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 did present a perspective that sometimes required us to adjust um, technically, um, and then where the important trade offs are, are to be made. And those trade-offs are not the obvious ones between education and, and security forces. It is often a trade-off between education and health. Or within health, a trade-off between um, a malaria program, funding a malaria program, and funding a maternal health program. Um, and hopefully that budget process concludes with an affordable spending plan. Because it comes back to this point that was made about you know, only promise that which you can deliver on. And if your budget um, looks too much like a, a political manifesto that is promising to do everything, um, but the funds haven't been allocated for that, um, you're going to run into, in, into some difficulty. I think we also need to give ourselves sufficient time to, to prepare that what, is, what I said is the most important document. Um, in South Africa, it's about nine months. Um, but there are some countries that um, process the budget over a much shorter period period of time. Um, 
But what the budget process also sometimes looks like or does is that it presents this facade, um, a facade that the, a country is, is, is preparing um, its, its, its policy document, it is taking all these things into consideration, um, it is filled with a lot of things um, and very little is, is done in terms of the important decisions that need to be made. So the questions I think that need to be asked here is, are we, repro are we using the budget process for reprioritization? Um, are we taking the hard decisions with regards to how do we, um, how are we going to be more efficient? So if there is a 20% inefficiency in health spending, you know, what are the hard decisions that we need to take and how does the budget process allow for, for, for that? And then we spoke about, about spending, spending reviews. I mean, when they are undertaken, do we really take the findings seriously? Do we really feed that back into the decisions that we, that we are taking? And then is it a, a single allocation, allocation process? Um, and I'm almost coming to the end. Um, so a PFM reform that was meant to, to support service delivery. And, 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 and when we think about this reform, we don't often associate it with, with service delivery. We associate it more with um, you know, getting a medium-term perspective in, um, in fiscal policy, um, where we are able to match um, a fiscal envelope with a, with a bottom-up spending plan. But I, I'd like to think that the medium-term um, expenditure framework in South Africa supported the rollout of the child support grant. Um, and I'd like to think that it's an example of what the medium-term expenditure framework was meant to do. Um, so we started off in, in 1998 where the child support grant was available to children under the age of seven. There was an eligibility test and there was an amount that was allocated to every child that passed um, that, that qualification. In 2003 to 2005, it was rolled out to children under the age of 14 because there was a con constitutional court decision that the grant must be made available to children up until the age of 18. Um, so this was a constitutional imperative where we used the tool of the medium-term expenditure framework to not, s well, to, to roll it out over a, 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 a medium-term a medium period. And then 2009, um, children up to the age of 15, and then progressively um, up, to, up to 18, um, about 12 million children are now on the grant. Um, so an MTF is not just about that matching of top-down, blah, 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 right? I mean, it, it, it should be thought of as a tool, um, as a very common reform across many, many um, African countries and, 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 and in the rest of the world that should be thought of as a, as a reform that, that should um, be linked to service delivery and not necessarily just thought of as a matching of the top-down fiscal um, framework with the bottom of spending plans of ministries, uh, of, of spending ministries. Um, and then just some, some final thoughts on, on PFM reforms with the potential to improve service <coughs> delivery but have, have un under-delivered. And, and some of the panelists have, have touched on this. I mean, the first one, procurement reforms have certainly hit a capability gap. Um, especially where they've been devolved to spending ministries and then um, decentralized to lower levels of government. Um, many countries that have done that too rapidly have found the, that they had to centralize it again. Um, so in, in South Africa, it was very rapidly decentralized. So a CEO of a hospital was responsible for the procurement of dialysis machines. And then we started finding out that we were spending six times the cost of, of, of a dialysis machine. And I mean, if we do the, the simple arithmetic, if you spend six times on one dialysis machine, you buy one instead of six, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think program-based budgeting, um, we, we did not think of it or devolve it to spending ministries. Because if you think of program-based budgeting, it's not the budgeting part that, mani that actually matters. It's the program management part that matters. 
and your program manager sits in your line ministry. It is the manager of the maternal health program. Um, it is the manager of primary um, education. Um, and this is a reform that I think we need to start thinking of as a reform that needs to be more located with the line ministries and less as a, a reform that is located um, with the Ministry of Finance as a budget reform, more of a management reform. Um, fiscal decentralization, um, we were doing some work in, in Benin and they were very interested in developing a more equitable um, distribution of, of, of revenue across the country. Um, and they looked quite closely at, at South Africa's Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Act. Um, but what was missing um, for the implementation um, of, of something that was more equitable was the data. So how many um, you know, healthcare facilities are there in the different, in, in the different states in, in, in Benin or the different um, um, areas in, in Benin? Um, how many children are enrolled in schools? How many primary schools are there? Which is all important data um, to bring about more equitable fiscal uh, decentralization. And then the one that we definitely um, you know, pay lip service to is this thing called value for money. I mean, I mean, I speak about it a lot. Um, we, we, we certainly heard um, from, from Dorian um, about efficiency and, and effectiveness, economy, equity, um, but very little is done to implement if, an efficiency gain. Um, sometimes we are aware of those inefficiencies, but we are not taking the very hard decisions. So if, there's, if there is not going to be additional money, what is the hard decision that we're going to take in the budget process that is going to bring about an efficiency and an efficiency gain? And there may be a, another one that I, that I thought of as I was listening to, to the other panelists was the cash management. It's also one of those reforms that, that um, many countries are undertaking. A lot of it is about introducing a cash management system, um, but that has not contributed to the r uh, right, m the amount that's been allocated, arriving in the correct amounts at the right time, and then being accounted, accounted for. Um, so let me stop there. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Neil. And thank you to you all. Um, well, I'd like to open it out for questions and comments from the floor and from uh, those people listening um, on, on live streaming. Um, I note that none of the panelists really responded to the three hypotheses idea that I rose, which only goes to show how, how little people listen to me. But uh, <clears throat> what I think did come across is, well, is some, <laughs> some, some common themes. I mean, I think all panelists agree on the importance of a closer relationship between sector ministries and ministries of finance on collaborative work. Uh, we also spoke about certain tools that have potential, spending reviews in particular, but tend to be underutilized or not utilized at the right times. Um, Neil, I thought, put, put quite an interesting positive spin on program budgeting. I mean, very often program budgeting is seen as the, the classic disaster of PFM reform. Uh, but I think probably the reason is because it's led from the centre and, and it's seen as a budget reform rather than a management reform, as, as Neil presented it. Uh, Dorian spoke about the importance of analysis, about you know, making sure that whatever allocations are made, there is a link to some analysis of what your policy goals are and the relationship between impacts and spending, uh, which I think is you know, a, a very good lesson that we can also uh, keep with us. And Sam spoke about, spoke about the importance of accountability frameworks, and in particular, accountability frameworks at the local level that ensure that the right structure of incentives are, are created. So some interesting thoughts from the panelists and others that I haven't summarized. Um, let me see if anybody has questions or, or comments. There's a hand there at the back, and I wanted to start at the back, so let's, let's start there, please. Thank you. If you could just uh, stand and introduce yourself. Uh, and, uh, and also be brief, if I can ask you all to be brief. Thank I'll, you. I'll try. Is that working? Um, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Alan Harding. Uh, I'm now an independent development economist. I was a senior economist at DFID for a number of years. Um, Andrew, you may remember, 
uh, back in, I think, about 2000, uh, we did a bit of work together on uh, budget support. Indeed. And I know, uh, I know budget support's not the focus of this particular event, but um, uh, we were involved in some of those early discussions about the evaluability of budget support, and I did a, a case study in Mozambique and uh, went on to be involved with managing some budget support programs linked very much with PFM programs in Zambia and a few other places. Um, I'd just be interested to know what, what's the what's the current thinking about for aid for countries that are still aid dependent to some extent for financing of their budgets? What, what's what's the feeling now about budget support as a modality? Is it a useful? Could it be a useful solution, for example, to some of the things that Sam was talking about? Underfunding of the education sector. How do you get the finance into education? in the most effective way that, uh, that uh, contributes to sort of local ownership and control. So if anybody has some thoughts on that, I'd be interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take two or three questions, please. Uh, yes, go ahead. Let's go with Marcel here. <coughs> uh, thank you. I'm Cody Marcel Mkeshman. I'm the Accountant General from Government of Rwanda. Actually, uh, my question is very simple because from the panelists, um, the planning was somehow not touched, and I was worried that maybe sometimes we've been considering the PFM reforms, just limiting them to budget reforms. So in that context, maybe um, uh, it's where we are failing because uh, the PFM reforms, if we're not addressing the issue of proper planning, it's where we are getting problems. For example, if I link with what uh, Doctor has mentioned, so uh, the planning process should be given much consideration because at the end, it's the one that should be informing the budget. But if we spend time to the budgeting process, then we forget about the plans. At the end, we are answering the long question because the planning should be informing the budgeting process. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Madam. Beaches Muganda. I'm Beaches Muganda from the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research in Nairobi. And uh, Sam, I'm very interested in your conclusion, or allow me to say claim, uh, of this uh, capacity gaps in financing for education. Um, I don't know to what extent you would generalize that, because in East Africa, I think we have a very robust framework in terms of, uh, Marcel just mentioned, the central planning unit, many policy analysts, and the regulatory agencies also provide advisory support in terms of developing the public policies. We also draw from think tanks like the Kenya Institute of Public Policy Research and Analysis. Thank you. Okay. So perhaps funding is not so much the issue. We'll come back to that one. Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Hi, Edward Hedger, Independent. Um, a question about spending reviews, uh, maybe direct companies has come up quite a lot. Um, maybe sort of add a, a thought, it sounds like they work as an effective tool when austerity is on the cards. One might argue also when abundance is on the cards, they're a sort of a useful device for that. But maybe I could ask, um, sort of Suzanne to expand and possibly Sam drawing on your experience as understand sort of working in the education ministry in the UK where the sense that um, how much is the missing opportunity for spending reviews to become a more effective tool something to do with technique or something to do with bureaucratic capability or how much is this to really a political question and if the real opportunity sought by spending reviews is reprioritization in a sort of steady state of expenditure is that something that's technique and official sensitive, or is that something that's really just a political question? We, we need to sort of accept that. Point. Okay. Did you have a question? No. Um, hi, my name is Jody. Uh, I'm from South Africa as well, Neil, and I hope you will forgive me for disagreeing with you. Um, <laughs> I'm not from the Western Cape. Um, but I think in my research and hopefully in the panel tomorrow where I chat about it, uh, you'll see. But I think that part of the issues we're really seeing is about whether finance and ministries of finance should be support structures to service delivery or whether they should be leading anything. 
And really on the ground from within these uh, service delivery sectors, there's the feeling that finance should not be the ones determining what is good, right? You can, you can say whether we've allocated budget in an, in an effective way or whether we are thinking about it in the right way, but that it shouldn't be a finance manager or the Ministry of Finance deciding which plans are good enough to get prioritized and which aren't. So I just want to push back a little bit and maybe ask you some thoughts on whether um, you've been thinking about that at all since leaving Treasury and now working in Cavalry with uh, different countries. Thank you. All right, let's get some answers to those questions. Um, Sam, do you want to start on the issue of whether budget support, in other words, a, a different type of support to governments in, in low-income countries would facilitate better funding for the education sector and better structures of accountability? Do you want to, to lead off on that one? Yeah, I, it's an interesting question. I think that um, it would certainly help to, certainly at the central level, it would help to... Um, to identify the level of misalignment between the promises that were being made and the actual requirements needed. What I haven't seen very much of is a kind of um, a true budgeting of what it would genuinely cost to deliver what is being promised. And I think um, support to do that would be useful. I think then um, as you go down the system and at the local level, there's a real question as to the financial management and budget support that kind of individual schools and uh, and local um, districts of offices have access to and have availability to, which I think goes to the heart of some of the questions that I, I raised earlier. And can I also test you a little bit on this theory about not enough funding being, being a yeah. key problem? Um, I mean, Neil gave us quite a nice example of the child support grant being rolled out in South Africa and mm. deliberately using a medium-term plan given their resource constraints. And our colleague Marcel also uh, chided us for not mm. talking enough about planning and long-term planning. Mm. I mean, perhaps there, there is a tool here that is just not used enough, or, or is it the case that the politics would never allow proper medium-term planning? Well, I don't get the sense, again, and I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, not a politician from, from, from any of the places we work, but I, I don't get the impression that it is viable to say that universal access to secondary education is 20, 30 years away. That you're not going to win an election if you say that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and nor should you. I mean, with the, it should be every every child should have universal, you know, access to, 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 to education. Um, but... Um, but, but then the finances just don't connect with that. So I'm not sure it, I think it is primarily a political problem rather than a, a, a planning problem and an expecta a citizen's expectation issue, which I think is a, they, they are re the reasonable expectations. Um, okay. I don't know if you wanted me to come back no, no. on any of the other points as well. We'll, 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 we'll come, come back, back to this. Okay. Dorian, can I ask you again on this planning question? I mean, you spoke quite a bit about the importance of policy analysis. And I think you gave us quite a positive story about being able to use policy analysis to change the direction of, of education spending, and not just education, sorry, health spending, but not just health spending, but also related legislation focused on, on, on health problems. Do you think that uh, more planning, more policy analysis, better medium-term perspectives are a way forward, or do you see some inherent limitations in that. Yeah, maybe that my opinion is really personal because when I was <coughs> presented, I was, uh, said that the prime minister said that it's a controversial minister in a way. Yeah. Uh, I spoke very little. He always explained uh, all stories in a long term, but at the end I said, yeah, but you said the same as, as I did. There will be no investment because there is cut the budget. So in a way, I always stick to analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, might be that in between, since I was a, in a role of politician and I'm nowadays as an, uh, working as an expert, it's like in relative and absolute numbers. So at the beginning, at the beginning of the election and at the beginning when the government is established, more or less they are speaking in absolute, they are tackling relative numbers. Mm. I fully agree that it should be analysis as the first step, then the second one, priority list. And then we should stick to relative numbers. In a way, for education, 5% or 2%, for health, 8%, and so on and so on. From that moment on, 
okay, for the second, we will have to establish the, the, the projection for the next five years. Health will remain the same, will increase and decrease, and, and in which sector we will take partial uh, uh, fundings to increase in other sectors, so prioritization. In the second step, ministries and uh, uh, experts, they should have to deal with the available budget right. and st stick to that. So, uh, in, some, in some parts of the healthcare system in countries which I work, they, they can manage, they can stick to that, they are using this approach and they just uh, opt to succeed with a certain relative percentage of the budget mm -hmm. and not always claiming that there is not enough uh, 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 budget in for different uh, projects. So analysis, prioritization, relative part of the budget and then stick and survive with that and uh, at the end true results come out with the extra need uh, in, 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 in the next years. But Thank it's you. very difficult because uh, uh, after the election, after the government is established, then the different influences uh, are there. And as I said once, um, uh, speaking from my sector, prime minister should be minister of health or at least minister of finance should be the minister of health and might be then we will face the reform. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, spending reviews. We had a question about spending reviews and also... Suzanne, Neil uh, spoke quite positively about the potential of spending reviews. Do you want to say a little bit more on that? Yeah, um, Ed was asking, you know, what the reason, I guess, for these not really taking off, given that there's a lot of potential there. And my experience is in just a couple of countries in, in this area, and I think it, it is capability related in the <laughs> Ministry of Finance, but it's also motivational, because the experience tends to be we do all this analysis and we have conclusions but the politicians are not interested in really making the hard decisions, so why bother? Yeah. And, and that's basically the, the crux of the matter. Um, so, but, I, but I still think there's some benefit in doing this kind of analysis, even if they're, they're not capable of making a decision now. Um, you have the foundation then. And the skills are developed at a very basic level. Yeah. The, the coordination and the skills are developed, which really should be done as part of the budgeting process and planning process anyway. Um, so that was my experience in the, in the region of Southeast Europe. Okay. Neil, do you want to pick up on that? I'm going to, I'm going to respond to Alan and then come to Jody yeah. here um, on the modality. Um, so I would say that the modality matters less. What matters is the use of the country systems. And the country systems can be used irrespective of the modality. Because by increasingly using country systems, you are contributing towards the strengthening of those systems. You are putting more resources into those systems. You are building up a, a capability, uh, whether it is procurement or auditing. Um, and sometimes when you talk about modality, it becomes very political. Um, so typically a Minister of Finance would say, are you going to provide budget support? If not, I'm less interested. Um, whereas I think Ministers of Finance should be asking, are you going to be using our country systems? If yes, then the modality doesn't matter that, that much. And if we're thinking about the theme of service delivery and how aid um, and the way that aid is programmed contributes towards improving service delivery, then I think it's about the use of country systems and not so much the, the modality. Um, Jody, my first part you're going to not like. The second part we're going to find common ground. <laughs> so, the, the, I mean, in the case of South Africa, the National Treasury is the only government department outside of the presidency that is named in the Constitution. So it, its role has been set up um, in terms of its responsibility and its custodianship. And I think that has been important in terms of scarcity, that you know where you are locating um, the preparation of what I said was the most important um, policy statement of, of a government. I think it comes to, you know, does the Treasury know what is good for the rest of the country? And I think they agree. No, it cannot, um, because 
And I mean, South Africa chose a planning commission as opposed to a planning ministry because it located rightfully the function of planning with line ministries. So if you education, you are doing education planning. And there's interesting work done by um, Professor Alan Sheik on what is a new, a modern um, treasury or ministry, fin ministry of finance look like. And it was this sort of policy coordinating role where you give yourself enough time, and I mentioned that the nine months, giving yourself enough time to bring those different constituents together. Um, and this is after, um, you know, a, a, a ministry of health would have decided on a policy. Um, and after they've um, done some preliminary analysis in terms of what it would cost and the capacity that is needed to implement, that that is what they would bring to a budget process. Um, and I mean, I, I spent about eight years um, being responsible for the budget process in, in South Africa. And I thought of it, I mean, you know, being a, a Democrat, um, I thought of it as being a very democratic and comprehensive um, process that, that allowed line ministries to present their case for um, further funding or for new funding. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you do need a, a treasury and you do need capacity within that treasury that is going to be able to not only do a random trade-off, but also come to some kind of a conclusion that this is a program we can afford over a medium term or that this is not something that we can afford um, immediately or that we shouldn't be funding the following. Um, and, and, and in building up that modern, that modern um, treasury, the people that were being recruited to the treasury were quite different, right? So it wasn't just the accountants or the lawyers. Um, the person that heads up the, um, the, the unit that um, looks after the health budget in the treasury is, is a medical doctor that also has a PhD in primary health. Um, so probably one of the best um, health economists in South Africa. Um, and I think that allows an, an, an opp opportunity for the Treasury to, um, I think, make a conclusion also. Um, and maybe not in, I suppose, an, uh, an arrogant way where you're saying, we know what is best for you. Mm -hmm. um, I also remember, and my last point, um, when, when Trevor Manuel left the Ministry of, of Finance in, in 2009, just before the April elections, and he said that it's going to become a lot more difficult to waive the Public Finance Management Act and say no or yes, because there was a lot of talk about this powerful treasury whose wings needed to be clipped. And he said that we're going to have to depend a lot more on being able to persuade and to persuade with knowledge. Um, and, and I think that the Treasury was building up that capability to, 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 to do that. Um, and in some way, you know, at, I think that also lends itself to having a good and strong Ministry of Finance um, so that you can have that sort of coordination that, that takes place. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, well, let, let's open this up to another round of questions. Um, one point I'd like to make is just that what I'm hearing from the panel, really, is that if ministries of finance find the right ways of working with sector ministries, if they use analysis in the right way, including analysis within spending reviews, and if they can link that analysis to political decisions, then we would begin to come closer to a decent marriage of good public finance and good service delivery. So I'm not hearing from the panel anybody who says, we need a different paradigm. We need to do things radically different. And I wonder if people are here today have a different view or, or indeed support that broad view. Simon, you're throwing your hand up straight away. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the microphone. <coughs> I lead a slightly strange life in that I spend quite a lot of my time in Scotland. Um, 
Scotland has the distinction that life expectancy at the moment at every age is falling. At every age in Scotland. I think it's probably true more broadly in the UK, but the figures that come out of Public Health England are not quite as widely distributed as what comes out of Public Health Scotland. So my question is, I don't think the answer for Scotland is purely pumping more money into health per se. In fact, the socioeconomic factors in Scotland have a bigger determinant on health outcomes than anything else. So I'm kind of, I, I'm picking up actually what Neil said. I think actually what's needed is a much more collaborative approach. I think some of these issues are too important to be left just to ministries of finance. I think actually in some cases they're too important to be left to ministries of health as well. I think, and I'm picking up what Marcel said, I think there's a need for a much better analysis, planning, focus on some of these problems that I would describe as wicked problems, which are not amenable to conventional approaches um, that we've kind of been talking about a little bit. So I'm saying, I mean, I think all that the panel said is really good, but I'm saying in the context of Scotland, not good enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was a, somebody just next to you there, but please go ahead. Um, somewhat relatedly, um, that I think most of the... Ex oh, yourself, Sorry, I'm Lorraine Hawkins. I, um, I've worked for ministries of finance or treasuries and health ministries, the World Bank and now mostly with WHO, on PFM, particularly in the health sector. My question um, relates to the... Uh, observation that in most of our discussion to date, we've talked about service delivery ministries and the finance ministry, but we haven't specifically discussed the relationship between those two different categories of ministry and the prime minister or president or and, and those administrations. And so um, some of the um, issues around the relative position and strength of the Ministry of Finance are often counterbalanced by having a very strong role for that administration or prime minister's department or whatever in the pol strategic policy coordination. Um, some of the issues, are, are, are some of the particular political dynamics around budget setting and priority setting often involve you know, alliances between, you know, in, in that triangle, different sort of shifting alliances and conflict between those parties. And I suppose what I'm interested in asking is, is you know, are we talking about single models for practice or, uh, um, and you know, for roles, responsibilities and capacities? Um, are, are some better than others? Um, or are there, there different models that we should talk about that may be more appropriate in different kind of constitutional and institutional settings? Thank you. Very interesting question. There was another hand near the back there, I think. Uh, was it? Was it? No, sorry. Well, well let's, let's come, come here. Uh, the, the, the lady here with the hair? Hey, hey. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Joanne Bosworth with uh, UNICEF. Um, I'd like to thank very much uh, ODI for putting on this conference. I think many of the um, uh, issues that the panel have raised uh, will be very familiar to uh, some of my colleagues who are working uh, in countries around the world. Um, uh, we've heard uh, quite a lot of mention of issues of efficiency and uh, effectiveness and the question of uh, uh, whether we all, all always need more more funds. And one of the things that we sometimes look at in UNICEF is also uh, equity. So the question sometimes you could get more by uh, you know, distributing resources more equitably. And when we think about, um, for example, in uh, education, whether you're putting your money into tertiary uh, education or into primary education, similar questions arise in health in connection with you know, referral services versus primary care services. Um, but my question is, uh, you know, to what extent are those kinds of issues, uh, should those kinds of issues come up in, in the context of PFM, or are they policy or political questions? Um, and, and if they are PFM questions, then you know, what kind of tools do we have for looking at those? Thank you. Let's come forward here, and then we'll Paolo afterwards. Hi, um, I'm Tom Haas. I'm a research fellow here at ODI. Um, and Joe, I want to ask a question that does directly relate to your kind of hypotheses that we started off with. Um, and 
th this comes from when, when we start talking about PFM, we often default to processes that are controlled by the Ministry of Finance. But public financial management is not just management of the public finances by the Ministry of Finance. It's also management of the public finances by sector ministries as well. Um, so, so my question is, when we're talking about or, or for PFM practitioners, have PFM practitioners got anything to offer those processes and management processes that happen within line ministries? Um, so kind of, and as we've got a mix of panelists with line ministry and, and ministry of finance backgrounds, what, what do they think that PFM practitioners have got to offer line ministries? Or in line with your kind of third hypothesis, you know, should they just stay well away and let line ministries get on with the else and we don't want another kind of professional community trying to impose their standards and norms on a on a different issue. Thank you. Yeah. Paolo, we'll take yours as the last question and we'll come back to the panel. Thank you. Paolo De Renzio uh, from the International Budget Partnership but also associate of ODI. My sense is that, I mean, as, as you were pointing out, the extent to which PFM systems help or hinder service delivery is a, is a question of coordination as many of you have said. And I, my question was really about picking up about a point on the role that donors play in helping or hindering that coordination. And in fact, how much donors are actually possibly making coordination more difficult in the relationship between ministries of finance and, and service ministries. Sam highlighted the point that very often education ministers feel more comfortable asking going around, you know, knocking on donors' doors, asking for different types of funding rather than going to the Ministry of Finance to uh, finance their own operations. Uh, Susan mentioned the fact that often experts, uh, technical assistance, other types of capacity building that are provided to Ministries of Finance on PFM issues are different and separate and often contradictory to similar types of assistance that are provided to, uh, to sector ministries. So, I mean, I confess when I was at Cape with Andrew 15 years ago, we were discussing these issues. They're still on the table. But my question is, you know, is there anything new that we can bring to the table in terms of trying to address some of these coordination failures? Thanks. Thank you. OK, I think a very interesting set of questions and challenges. Uh, Sam, do you want to start? <laughs> with all of those questions? <laughs> um, well, pick I'll, I'll pick, a, I'll pick out a few that I thought, I thought I'll pick out a few. I mean, I think so. Uh, just a, a sort of larger observation about this whole conversation. I, as someone mentioned uh, earlier, I used to work in uh, the Department for Education here as an advisor to our Secretary of State in, in the UK. And you know, all of these things are, uh, are so relational in politics and policy. It so depends who the individual ministers are and who they're friends with in the cabinet and whether they're friends with the PM and so on. Um, and there was a question around this kind of relationship between the <coughs> president's office, the PM, the, you know, the ministers. It, it's so different in every country. And you can't really work in a country until you understand what those, that kind of relationship map looks like and, and, and nor can you really come up with a set of solutions for any particular ministry or work with a ministry without really understanding what that relationship set of relationships look like. And just to give a very personal anecdote, when I was working on the spending review here, we got a much better settlement than other departments back in 2010 because my minister was friends with the prime minister. Like, I mean, that literally, there was, you know, you can have as much process and as analysis and as, as you like. But he was friends with the Prime Minister and he got a better settlement as a result. So that is just always important to remember that these are, these, these are such relational um, issues. Um, I think on the point about equity, I thought that was um, uh, very well made. One project we're currently working on in Cote d'Ivoire, they have a, a subsidy programme for secondary schools, uh, non-state secondary schools, where they, to help increase access, they pay fees uh, of kids and we're, and we're sort of helping them think about how that could be targeted more effectively at um, uh, young people or regions of the country where they couldn't pay fees themselves because there's a real dead weight in that program um, and given they're quite a long way from universal access it seems to make sense at least at the moment to focus on those parts of the country where people couldn't, parents couldn't pay their own fees. So there, there's definitely ways of thinking creatively and inventively about how you can um, uh, use equity as a lever for, for better financial management. Um, and then the last one I'll sort of just um, pick up on is the last point that was made around 
donors, I do think this is incredibly important because I think the way, and this may not be true in other sectors, but certainly in education, the way a lot of multilateral organisations and foundations think about policy is quite unhelpful because the deliverers that they look for are, are very high level policy outputs, not outcomes, because the outcomes are very are so far down the line and they want some kind of immediate output. Um, but that then drives the whole machinery of ministries around the development of policy products rather than actually doing anything on the ground. Um, and there's definitely something there about how donors could think uh, much more long term around the, uh, the, the kinds of work that would really be useful rather than thinking we've got to have some kind of output within a year, within two years, within three years that we could then show to our boards and trustees and funders. Mm -hmm. Tricky, I know, but I think it's a real issue. Dorian, do you want to respond in particular to the policy challenge that Simon raised and also the question that Lorraine raised about whether you know, we're, we're not embracing enough the role of the Prime Minister or the President or, or the Planning Minister in this process? Yeah. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, when I concluded that the, probably the, for healthcare reforms, the, one of the potential best result would be if Prime Minister would be the Minister of Health or at least uh, the Minister of Health would have uh, support of Prime Minister. But it actually, it happened once in Slovenia, but what the Lady Minister launched, uh, we are still suffering nowadays and trying to um, deal with uh, her proposals and solutions. Um, for sure, there should be uh, support from Prime Minister office. In, in some countries, they're trying to engage so-called experts or right hands for different sectors, uh, those who are uh, on a priority list of government. In, in some countries, this might be one of the, the approaches. Uh, um, no, not yet results uh, of this attempt. Um, if, I, if I may, I will add another um, uh, comment. We said before, uh, analysis, then setting priorities, but at the end, we, we should analyze what we mm -hmm. reached. So in a way, uh, there was a question about uh, reviewing. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. It's a problem of bureaucracy. It's a problem of poli political approach. But um, at least in, in majority of countries I work is lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, lack of knowledge at the political level, let, uh, lack of knowledge at the bureau bureaucratic uh, uh, approach, and especially the exp ex expert part. So in a way, <coughs> defining the, the the priorities and defining the projects, there should be a clear list of data needed indicators and potentially an independent agency or organization which would evaluate at the end present. Uh, the problem of being focused on outcomes is that um, political pol politicians will never uh, appreciate uh, a, a presentation of outcomes because uh, there is uh, not a lot of space to adapt them mm -hmm. to political uh, goals. But anyway, if we want to succeed in our, um, in our uh, project, we should focus on outcomes and we should let this analysis to experts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, uh, do you want to um, comment? Just a couple of comments related to Tom's question on have PFM practitioners got anything to offer line ministries. Um, there are PFM practitioners in line ministries, right? So uh, it's slightly confusing, but if I interpret what you're saying as those in the Ministry of Finance, the PFM practitioners, then I think, I think they should have something to offer. I think ideally they should have an advisory role for people working in PFM processes in line ministries. I don't think that's necessarily happening in many countries, mm. certainly not in my region. Um, but I... I, th I think it would be quite dangerous just to leave them to, to get on with things. Mm. Um, and in any case, they wouldn't allow them because they do have this compliance approach to, to wh whatever they're doing. Whilst that's not no. that effective, um, I, think, I think the role could be developed over time to a more kind of supportive and advisory role. Um, and on the donors, very, very, very quick... Um, quick comment on that. I, s I still think there are a lot of parallel processes developed by donors um, and it's not gone away but despite mm. discussing this for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I agree.
Gregory. <laughs> Neil. Okay, on um, the, the question by the person from UNICEF. On, um, so I, I certainly agree that um, there are two more measures that need to be added to efficiency, effectiveness, and economy, and one of them being um, ethic, um, equity, the other one being ethical behavior. Um, so measuring whether the services have been delivered in an ethical manner. Um, equity is certainly very important because you'd want to ensure that free learning material that is meant to be delivered to a no-fee school arrives there on time, um, um, as close to the start of the uh, of the school year, and not hidden in some warehouse where it starts to starts to get rotten and then get dumped um, because the person who did not get it to the school on time is is afraid of being of being prosecuted. You'd also want to start looking at you know whether the education outcomes of that. Um, no fee primary school is is improving, um, and I, that I think that your Ministry of Education, if we stay with the example, would be the best place to be measuring um, whether that equity measure is 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 being is being a achieved. Um, maybe final, just on uh, um, I mean an example of PFM practitioners having anything to offer. So I, I, I agree with Susan that I mean they, they are PFM pr practitioners and some can in Lyme ministries and some countries have formalized it. I mean in, in the case of South Africa, um, every Lyme ministry had to appoint a chief financial officer. And it had some positives and some um, negatives. I mean the positives were that they were very I mean they were typically accountants um, and they they helped in ensuring that the ministry was sticking to the prescripts of the Public Finance Management Act and that um, financial statements were prepared in in, in accordance with. Um, the, the the negatives were that they were start they were starting to be put forward as the people that interact with the Treasury. Mm. Whereas I think when you are doing program-based budgeting um, and you are concerned about the performance of the program manager, um, then it is the program manager that you want to be interacting more um, um, with with your treasury. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. do you want to say anything on the triangle between sector ministries, finance ministry, and in the case of South Africa, the president? It, are there any lessons from from yeah. your period in South Africa? So, in successful finance ministers in South Africa have been the ones that had the full backing of the president. Right. Um, and it's that kind of air cover that is provided to the ground troops that need to be fighting the battles, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... I think good finance ministers speak about the air cover that they were provided by their presidents or, or their prime ministers. Yeah. Um, we we tried as as much to include the presidency in the various technical decisions and also the political oversight in the budget process. So there was a thing called the Ministers Committee on the Budget that was chaired by the finance minister. And it had the minister in the presidency that was a member of that. Uh, and that is a good filter. It's a good link to, to, to the president. There are things you can do within your process where um, you make time to see the president before you table your budget, um, for instance. Right? Um, um, <laughs> I, I see somebody shaking their head. <laughs> Maybe this is a contextual yeah. issue, right? It depends who the president is. Actually, I was when you mentioned that the ministers who had the good terms in the Ministry of Finance were the ones having good relation with the president. I was trying to find out why not. Uh, not good relation with president, but the one who is implementing what government mm. has put forward as yeah. the priorities. Because uh, at that 
Actually, it's coming back to what you said. If there is no secret dealings, mm. if everything is open, if the planning are properly done and it's comprehensive, including the uh, the national agenda, why do you need to to be in a good relationship? Why can't you stand on what is national priorities? Then you you deliver toward that one. So the reason why I was just doing this because it was becoming more personal to do. To, to, to the extent that I was uh, even uh, watching what is happening in the, in the South African parliament, I was wondering, uh, sorry, that is why I, 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 I did that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think the issue is probably that relationships matter. I mean, Sam illustrated that point, and I think... And I think they, You're they, saying the they, same. there are some um, differences in the parliamentary system and the presidential system, right? Mm. I mean, where in the parliamentary system you have the Minister of Finance that, that tables the budget. So I think that having the president as the, an ally um, that is familiar with what um, has informed the decisions um, that, that has gone in, into the budget is, is important. And, and I think a good politician as a Minister of Finance will ensure that that is, that that is the case. Um, I think in the presidential system where it's the president that, that is the one that tables budget, like in Nigeria, and I think in Liberia you also have that. There's often, um, you know, this sort of a long period of haggling in, in the legislature and um, where you have legislators that have um, greater amendment powers um, often the budget that they approve doesn't look like the budget that the president has, has tabled. And that is worrying because, I mean, the analysis, the consultations, the dialogue that has gone into the budget process is then missing. Yes. Um, because in your, in, in your presidential system where you do have these powerful legislators, they throw, often throw things in. Um, um, to to win support from their various constituencies. Okay, that's actually a pending issue. How one engages the legislature here, uh, which maybe converts the triangle into a square or something like that. Um, we have a few interesting questions uh, from the live stream. Um, I mean, one a little bit techy, but I think very interesting. On reforms linked to efforts towards treasury single accounts, how useful has this been for improving service delivery, in particular in social sectors? Um, Suzanne, do you want to speak to that? Something on the usefulness of treasury single accounts? <coughs> I think, well, obviously I'm going to say they're useful okay. because um, <laughs> uh, it gives treasury better oversight. But it also means that, theoretically anyway, and I think the evidence is there to prove this, <laughs> that the cash is there and available where it's needed. So it's yes. not yeah. sitting in a pot in the, in the um, Ministry of Social Welfare uh, when there are needs in the Ministry of Health. Yes. So it's about kind of bringing um, the cash together and making it available where it's needed and when it's needed. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's one of these win-win things yes. that if you, if you just avoid idle balances, then everyone's going to benefit in one way or another. Yeah. Yes. And that's... So, that's um, so I think I mean, that's probably the, the single most important thing about a treasury single account mm. is that you know where those cash yes. balances are. Exactly. Um, and it's not really about having a single account. No. Um, but then the next trick is whether the Ministry of Finance or those that manage the cash in the Ministry of Finance have the powers to access that cash. Mm -hmm. um, because I, th I think as we heard from um, Ratan that this morning, sometimes that is not as, that is a lot more difficult um, to, to, to access. Okay. We have another question here, which I think I'll throw over to you, Sam, from uh, Marianne Caballero of the Tony Blair Institute of Governance. Speaking in the case of LDCs where resources are very limited and where improving service delivery as a whole may not be a relevant objective, is it feasible to think about targeting PFM reforms to specific basic services that can at least be delivered even in those sorts of settings? I mean, I'm not yeah. sure in education what we would think about as, as the basics. Yeah, I mean, it's really... It's a good question. I mean, I think so. this goes back to something I've, I've sort of touched on a few times, which is that even in some of the uh, least well-resourced countries in the world, like Sierra Leone, which is somewhere where, where we work, um, there is still this aspiration for universal secondary education. Now, 
you could argue that it makes more sense um, at the moment to focus on ensuring uh, a level of quality in basic education and that, that there is the full access to basic education and then uh, and focus your reform efforts around that rather than try, trying to t you know go go up to second you know universal secondary and and beyond that said as i've been saying that politically just isn't a palatable message to anybody so how do you how do you um uh, how do you how do you focus your kind of day-to-day -day efforts on uh, something where you can make a real and immediate difference while also being true to the sort of democratic desire of the citizenry i think that's a real tension that is uh, goes to the heart of that question. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Okay. Um, and then the final one is about uh, procurement processes. Mm -hmm. And it relates in particular to the interference of politics in local procurement committees at subnational level. And, and the question is, um, are there ways in which public finance uh, reforms can avoid capture of procurement committees by by uh, political interests. <laughs> mm. I mean, we certainly ran into this when we decentralized procurement um, too quickly. Um, and I think that that capability gap allows for political interference. Um, because it's not only about sticking to the rules. Um, it's, it's also about being able to ensure fairness, to speak truth to power, to say no, mm -hmm. to be prepared to be dismissed, um, to, I think, think a bit laterally around how do I cover myself? Um, and and, and if, we, if we look at the more recent procurement reforms in South Africa, I mean, a lot of it has been about centralizing again because there were officials that were prepared to blow the whistle um, on um, corruption that was, that was taking place, especially in um, the provinces and, and in local authorities, but also in national um, line, line ministries. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, this is an important one that we're going to, a problem that we're going to have to crack because, I mean, it is central to service delivery. I mean, it is about the procurement of the drugs. It is about the, the company that's going to be building the health facility. Mm. It's about whether we are paying, you know, six times for a single um, dialysis machine. Right, um, right. But what you're suggesting is that it might imply a degree of re-centralization in some cases, or indeed staged decentralization, so that some provinces or sector ministries would have more procurement powers than others, something like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, unless we have any burning questions, I think we can uh, finish early. Uh, I'd like to firstly thank uh, our panelists for their thoughts and uh, reflections. Um, two announcements. Firstly, a plug uh, for this afternoon's session, which is actually deliberately speaking about how analysis can be used and how analysis can be made practical and influential. Uh, I'll give a double plug to my colleague Segai from Ethiopia. We worked together on a value for money exercise in health where we really tried to keep the process simple, make sure that we ended up with some conclusions that could be picked up at the political level, and the final result was a health compact between the finance minister and the health minister. So even though the analysis was, was sometimes more complicated than we had wished, we ended up with, I think, something simple, and there's, there's a nice story coming out this afternoon, so I hope you'll be able to join. Some of the other stories I'm not so, so familiar with, but they're contrasting experiences about how to use analysis to help public finance decision-making. Um, we're going to on the request of a number of participants, reorganize the floor uh, into the floor that is normally used, where the head table will be on this side, and you will all be in a semicircle around. So because the room is being reorganized, you are asked not to hang around too much in these corridors, because you might get bashed by chairs and pieces of equipment. 
So lunch is in the uh, area where we were having coffee earlier. And there's two rooms at the side, three and four, I think. Yeah, there's two rooms at the side which are free for you to sit down if you like to eat at a table, as I do. Um, or if you want to mill around, please stay there or in the eating area and not in the corridor. And we'll start again at two. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you.